Today we are continuing the study of the gift of tongues part 3 of 3. If you have missed part 1 and part 2, kindly watch them to understand part 3 better. Of the 14 epistles written by Apostle Paul, only in 1 Corinthians he mentions the gift of tongues. He writes this chapter of 1 Corinthians 14 to correct them of their misuse of this gift. The Corinthian church was chaotic. In his first letter, Paul corrected them for many errors and practices. They were divided on whom to follow, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Christ. They had a lot of problems, the incest problem lawsuits among brethren, eating foods offered to idols, abuse of the Lord's Supper, being disorderly in church service, denying the resurrection of Jesus, etc. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul corrected the misuse of the gift of tongues, which we will focus on today. Some people think that the gift of tongues in 1 Corinthians 14 differs from Acts chapter 2, but that is untrue. Dr. Luke, the traveling companion of Apostle Paul, wrote the book of Acts after 1 Corinthians was written. Luke uses the same word, glossa, that Paul used in 1 Corinthians. And glossa means language. As noted in part 1, the word unknown is not in the Greek original. It is evident that Paul was referring to earthly languages in 1 Corinthians 14, for he wrote in verse 10, undoubtedly there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. So Paul is not talking about meaningless gibberish but languages of the world that have meaning. He again confirms that the Corinthians spoke earthly languages by quoting an Old Testament passage to prove his point. He wrote in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 14, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So Isaiah prophesied this gift of tongues. Paul was quoting Isaiah. The gift of tongues is God using people of other tongues and other lips, as Isaiah and Paul mentioned, to communicate the gospel. That was also demonstrated in Acts chapter 2 when God used people of other tongues and other lips to speak to people of 15 different nations and languages. Some people think that tongues spoken in 1 Corinthians 14 are the language of angels because Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Was Paul speaking in the language of angels? No. First of all, why should Paul speak in the language of angels? The angels understand and speak human languages. Angels appeared to Abraham, Daniel, Mary, Peter, and others. And they communicated with God's people in human languages. What did Paul mean when he wrote, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels? The word though means even if. Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Did Paul give all his goods to feed the poor? No. Did Paul give his body to be burned? Not at all. Paul was not burnt 
at the end of his life. History tells us that he was beheaded. In 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Paul said that even if a man speaks in tongues of angels, but does not have love, he is nothing. That was Paul's point. Some people think that praying in these gibberish tongues is important because it doesn't allow Satan to understand what is spoken. Have you heard people say that? I can't understand this logic because why would one hide it from Satan when the devil fears seeing God's people pray? The pen of inspiration says, at the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. Yes, testimonies for the church. Volume 1, page 345-346. So we must verbalize that our prayers might make Satan and his host tremble. Amen? An important rule is that any scripture passage must be interpreted harmoniously with the foundational passage. For example, Genesis chapters 1 and 2 are the foundational passages for the creation story. And the four gospels, they are the foundational passages for the redemption story. All of the passages of scripture about creation must be interpreted in the light of Genesis 1 and 2, the foundational passage. Likewise, all the scriptures discussing redemption must be interpreted in the light of the foundational passage of the four Gospels. Acts 2 is the foundational passage of tongue speaking. Acts chapter 10, chapter 19, and 1 Corinthians 14 are the only other places where tongue speaking is mentioned. However, they must be interpreted in the light of Acts 2, the foundational chapter where the gift of tongues was first demonstrated. Now we will go to the most challenging verse of this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Paul writes, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Our charismatic friends use this verse and they declare that when they speak in gibberish tongues, they're speaking to God and not to people, they say. And they are speaking mysteries by the Holy Spirit's enablings, they say. First, let us ascertain the meaning of mysteries. For it says here, he speaketh mysteries. In all his letters, Paul uses the word mystery around 20 times. And it simply means gospel message. For example, he wrote in Ephesians 6 and verse 9, the mystery of the gospel. And again, uh, he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That is the mystery. The truths of the gospel being proclaimed, where God became man. That is a mystery. God died for us. That is the mystery. The gospel itself is called mystery. The phrase, in the spirit he speaketh mysteries, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, means the speaker of tongues is preaching the gospel by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. To whom do we need to preach the mysteries of the gospel? To God or to people? Obviously, we need to preach the mysteries of the gospel to the people. But why did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 14, 2, 
For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. That is because the Corinthians were using this gift in a wrong place. Paul proceeded to say, For no man understandeth him. Man is supposed to understand what is spoken in tongues, which is why this gift was given. Now, is it possible that when the true gift of tongues is spoken, some people don't understand? Yes. We see that in Acts chapter 2 as well, the foundational chapter of the gift of tongues. In part two of our study, we saw two groups of Jews gathered to hear the disciples speak in tongues. The local Jews who lived in Jerusalem and Judea and the diaspora Jews who came from around 15 different nations. While the diaspora Jews understood what the disciples spoke in their native tongue, the local Jews did not understand them because it was not spoken in the regional language of Judea, Aramaic and Hebrew. Since that group of audience did not understand what was preached, they accused the apostles of being drunk. We see the same scenario here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul wrote, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? The group of the unlearned and unbelievers will call the tongue speaker mad. The unlearned are those who have not learned or understood and studied that particular language that is spoken. And the unbelievers, as we know, don't believe the message itself. In Acts 2, we also saw this happen. The unlearned and the unbelievers call the apostles as drunk. They accuse them of being drunk. In Acts 2, a small segment of people didn't understand what was spoken. But in the Corinthian church, Paul writes, For no man understandeth him. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Now, if I have the gift of tongues to speak French, and I speak French in an English congregation, who will understand me? Only God. That was the scenario in the Corinthian church. They were using the right gift in the wrong place. But the modern tongues spoken in the charismatic and Pentecostal churches are not earthly languages. The speaker doesn't understand, the hearers don't understand, neither God understands. It's totally meaningless gibberish. The servant of the Lord writes in Maranatha, page 154, they have an unmeaning gibberish, which they call the unknown tongue, which is unknown not only by man, but by the Lord and all of heaven and all heaven. As we studied in part one, the gift of tongues was primarily given for evangelism in taking the gospel message to unbelievers. As we see in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10 and 19, it is a gift to be used outside the church to reach unbelievers, to bring them to the church. The Corinthian church members used it to brag among believers in the church. Paul was correcting them on this. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, Wherefore, tongue are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Because it was 
the genuine gift of tongue, he still gave them permission to use it in the church with strict conditions. Number one, only two or three can speak in tongues in the church. Number two, he said, they cannot speak simultaneously, but by turn. Number three, Paul said, they are permitted to speak only with an interpreter. And number four, he said, if no interpreter is present, they should not speak in tongues. Let's read what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 27 and 28. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. It is astonishing to note that our charismatic and Pentecostal brethren who quote 1 Corinthians 14, 2, to support their unknown tongues, completely ignore the rest of 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul corrects the misuse of this gift and lays down some important rules. In most of the churches, more than three people speak in tongues, and sometimes half the church members, they participate in tongue speaking. Also, most of them, most of the time, it is all spoken simultaneously, and there is no interpretation of tongues too. Their tongue are not just counterfeit. The rules of tongue speaking are completely disregarded as well. As we close in Revelation 18, God calls his faithful people in Babylon to come out of her. Babylon comes from the word Babel, where the confusion of tongue speaking began, as we saw in part one. Beloved, the second Pentecost is coming. We are told in the Great Controversy, page 612, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. What about the gift of tongues? That will be restored too, as the everlasting gospel must go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Revelation 14 and verse 6. The pen of inspiration declares, Then, as at the day of Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. Rivian Herald, July 20, 1886. That's about the gift of tongues. It's a real language of earth where God enables his people to speak through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that unbelievers might be attracted to the truth. May God prepare us for the latter rain so that we would receive the genuine gift of tongues. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the study and the series of the gift of tongues. I pray that people would be set free from confusion and people, Lord, might follow the truth alone. Prepare our hearts for the latter rain when the real tongues will be restored as the gospel reaches to the whole world and Jesus will come. To this end, we give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and God bless.